course, at this stage, all eyes on the Sudan internationally in terms of the referendum that's scheduled to take place early January to decide on the status of southern Sudan and whether it should remain a part of northern Sudan and all the history of the country taken into consideration. Some people are already raising the alarm that there is a possibility that war could break out. Is that a real possibility or is that an alarmist view? I'm, uh, what our report does is our report discusses the costs that would be incurred if a war breaks out. And as you mentioned in the headline, if a war breaks out, then our, our report suggests that costs could exceed $100 billion. Okay, do you believe that the chances of war are real? Should we be even having this conversation? Well, I think that the, uh, the fact that we were asked to produce this report suggests that there is a, uh, suggests that some people think that there is a real chance that conflict, there will be increased conflict following or leading up to a referendum. Um, I'm obviously best qualified to speak about the economics in the case that conflict does, does arise. Okay, let's talk about the economics because we just needed to clarify the reality of the threat. Three scenarios in your report, all of them basically suggest that in the event that the vote is yes for independence for southern Sudan, there are three ways in which the government could respond. One would be to sabotage an independent country. Another would be all-out conflict. Another would be the challenges of just getting southern Sudan up and running as an economy. Um, what would that mean economically and politically for the region? That's right. I think the, what the report does is it looks through a series of scenarios from, as you were suggesting, a sort of low-level conflict scenario to a very high-level conflict scenario and tries to understand the economic costs, the economic costs to Sudan itself, as well as the economic costs to countries in the region that have trade and economic and financial relationships with Sudan and to the wider international community. And so across those scenarios, as you describe them, we estimate costs that could range anywhere from at the lower end of the spectrum, maybe 50 to 100 billion dollars for that group of actors, all the way up to, in the case of the very serious full-blown conflict that you were suggesting under the high-level scenario, upwards of 300 billion dollars. Now, obviously, Sudan has emerged as the third largest producer of oil, and some would say it's still not happening at optimum level. There's still a lot of ground to be gained in this particular area. But in the event that there could be a war, there is the threat of um, oil production being interfered with and being hampered. What would that mean financially for Sudan? Correct. Well, oil currently contributes, depending on the figures, between about 10 and 20 percent of Sudan's GDP, which is about 6 to 13 billion dollars a year, and obviously is a very significant proportion of revenue that goes both to the government in the south of Sudan and also to the government in the north. In the event of war, uh, likelihood is that that oil supply would be interrupted, and that would immediately clearly uh, reduce by six to 13 billion dollars revenue coming into Sudan that currently depends on that oil export. Obviously there's a lot of controversy around the peace agreement which expires in January um, in tandem with this referendum. But one of the things that North and Southern Sudan haven't been able to agree on is issues around revenue sharing. The South always saying that it's not a transparent process how the oil is produced and how the money flows uh, from the corporates through royalties and the like. In the event of war, what are we likely to see in terms of oil and the revenues seeping into an independent southern Sudan? I think it's very hard to say, and certainly we don't explore that in any detail in our analysis. What is clear um, is that in the event of war, if production were to be, were to be stopped, then you would lose the amounts of money that we were discussing, six to 13 billion dollars, and the, the government in southern Sudan currently is overwhelmingly dependent in revenue terms on that oil revenue, about 98% of its revenue comes from the oil exports with about 50% of the government's revenue in the north coming from oil exports. Now countries in the region are said to also be very vulnerable to the tensions that exist at the moment and that whereas Sudan would see cost to GDP of about 50 billion if war was to break out, neighboring states would suffer to the tune of 25 billion. That's significant. 
it's a significant cost to, to the neighboring states. And uh, some of them have considerable uh, investments in the region and considerable trade relationships with, uh, with Sudan and southern Sudan um, in areas of agriculture, financial services, breweries, and others that are looking to uh, invest in regions of Sudan. Assets which could be either destroyed or um, have to be abandoned in the case of conflict. And that forms the basis of some of our analysis around the cost to the region, um, which, as you said, it could be upwards of $25 billion in the case of a conflict. Jean-Francois Mercier is our guest host, and I'd like to bring him into the conversation. Sudan plagued by numerous problems, and I think a lot of people hoping that these problems don't permeate um, this referendum process. But as an emerging oil producer, I think many would argue Sudan can't afford a situation of any kind of conflict because everybody stands to gain from oil production. Um, when people are looking at new oil frontiers and assets to invest in, is the Sudan front of mind? I think it would be, but I would make a little correction to what you say when you say everybody stands to gain from higher oil production. Mm -hmm. Yes, on the condition that you do have the proper infrastructure, and by infrastructure I also mean the legal, political, governance infrastructure mm -hmm. that is necessary to use that oil money quite well. We've seen far too many cases of the resource curse, mm -hmm. in particular in Africa and in particular in some of these countries which, a bit like Sudan, straddled what I would call the, the, the Sahelian border, mm -hmm. where different people, different cultures, different ways of life were put together into new states by colonial boundaries that were, that were drawn in the 19th century. And we've seen it for many times with Nigeria. We're seeing some progress in Nigeria now, but the previous old booms were largely regarded as often mm -hmm. wasted because of corruption, because of conflict between different right. Uh, political groups often re re representing ethnic groups. So in the case of Sudan, which has gone, as we all know, through re repeated crises, which has not had a, a, a unity, right. the, the, the important thing will be how is the, these, right. uh, the consequence of these referendum managed. How are we likely to see the landscape change? And I'll give you a context. We've already heard the United States government urge the government in Khartoum to support the process that's currently underway, even saying, if you do so, we will lift sanctions. And this has been a very contentious issue because US companies have wanted to prospect for oil and gain licenses in the Sudan but because of the diplomatic tensions haven't been able to do so and so with the Americans out of the equation it's given um, a leverage to companies from Europe and especially Chinese companies to invest in the oil sector in the Sudan yes yes and then it raises the issue as to what is really the the motivation behind the promise of lifting sanctions from one country or another or another, you know, is it trying to regain some market share that has been lost to competitors, or is it really a condition attached to uh, uh, respecting uh, the outcome of the referendum? And then the risk is always that uh, a, a government which tries to play one superpower, one uh, major investor against one other, might think, well, uh, that is a bluff, you know, they want to do business with us anyway, so they might tolerate uh, uh, us uh, even if we don't play by the political rules they, they set. So that, that, is, that, is, that, that is an additional risk. How much teeth is diplomacy prepared to, prepared to get? And also, also how much can the uh, U.S. try and gain, how much support could the U.S., if they retry to put pressure on the Khartoum government, gain from Europe and China, which, as you say, have maybe some uh, investor interests that conflict a little bit with that of the United States? Thanks for raising those caveats. Matthew Bell, final question to you. We've spoken about the commercial uh, costs. What about the humanitarian costs? Can donors stretch themselves further? They've been involved in the Sudan throughout the 20 years of civil war between North and South, and they've been overly extended recently, along with the African Union, in Darfur. Yes, well, I think that uh, the humanitarian costs are clearly at the forefront of of everybody's mind, and the previous conflicts in Sudan have illustrated how high those humanitarian costs could be. I think the purpose of the report that we've brought out today is to bring a slightly different focus, and not to, in any way to dismiss those humanitarian costs, but to ask the question, given the investments of money, time, and effort that is required and will be required to secure a peace in Sudan, is it worthwhile, that effort and that money? And I think what we've illustrated is that the costs of conflict could be potentially so high that that initial investment that's going on now and hopefully will continue is clearly worthwhile.